All right, so welcome to module number 20. Uh, in the previous module number 19, we finished covering the scientific programming material, and now we're going to start talking about optimization for a few modules. Uh, what is optimization? So uh, Wikipedia states that in mathematics, computer science, and operations research, mathematical optimization, alternatively mathematic programming, or simply optimization, is the selection of a best element with regard to some criterion from some set of available alternatives. So we want to find the best under some criterion. Some examples. Application number one, you want to schedule classrooms. And here's a real story. Uh, NC State has classrooms, classes, physical buildings on multiple campuses, of course. Uh, this may not be, this may be less relevant what I'm about to tell you in the current semester during the pandemic, but typically there are, of course, uh, buildings on Centennial Campus, Main Campus, etc. And there are uh, not just multiple classes, dozens of buildings on each campus, etc. Multiple classrooms typically per building, and we want a good schedule. What does good mean? So we want some availability of rooms. Uh, so we, we don't want to take up all the rooms. We need to leave a bit free. Uh, we want proximity of classrooms to department. So real story, they wanted me to teach a class uh, on main campus and uh, as at least in a normal se semester, you'd be aware that uh, I'm located on Centennial campus and not only that, driving to main campus is uh, inconvenient, uh, to put it mildly, because there's a, a complete parking mess, okay? So uh, instructors have day and time preferences. So fortunately, I've kind of both, both my courses, I've uh, moved into this Monday, Monday, Wednesday slot, which for the majority of students, middle of the day is relatively convenient. Some people dislike the early morning, some people dislike the evening, but you know, middle of the day is okay. We also wanna match the size of the rooms to the anticipated class enrollments. Uh, I had a semester where I had 20 students and they put me uh, in a hall that was appropriate for 300 students, so that was, not efficient utilization. And we also want to avoid conflicts between course pairs of interest to students, or, or in other words, if you have another course exactly the same days, the same time, um, if that's an infrequent combination, it's okay, but we don't want half the students to have that. Another application, L1 recovery, and we're going to discuss this some more when we get to uh, the sparse signal processing material and when we get to machine learning. So among infinitely many solutions, Seek the solution with the smallest L1 norm. What's the L1 norm? It's the sum of absolute values. So we have a constraint y equals phi times x. Phi is a matrix. X is an unknown vector that we're trying to estimate. Y are measurements. And among the solutions of the measurements, y equals phi x, we're going to return x hat, which is the solution with the smallest L1 norm. The smallest sum of absolute values. Again, we're going to evaluate this later in the course. This can be expressed as follows. X is a vector, okay, and X is going to be related to two vectors, X positive and X negative. X positive is going to be a vector which is uh, greater than or equal to zero. And x negative is also going to be a vector which is greater than or equal to zero. So th these are both non-negative vectors, but we're subtracting x negative from x positive. And we can now express the L1 norm as a summation over all the elements of xp and all the elements of xn, the positive and the negative. And recall, these are both non-negative uh, vectors. And because of that, the absolute value of each is equal to themselves. So now what we want to minimize is, well, x is xp minus xn. We want to minimize the L1 norm, which is the summation of xp plus xn plus instead of minus. So we're minimizing the summation over xp plus xn subject to y equals phi x. Okay, so let's jot this down. y equals phi x, which is equal to phi times xp minus xn, which is equal to phi times xp minus phi times xn. 
um, we need this constraint that y is equal to phi xp minus phi xn. We also need a constraint that xp is non-negative and xn is non-negative. So again, we're going to see this application, the specific optimization later down the road. And optimization is a way how to solve this solution, how to provide this L window. Next application, number three, reducing fuel consumption. Suppose that uh, perhaps at this time during the pandemic, gas prices are relatively affordable, but suppose that they increase by a lot and you're running a truck fleet company or maybe you're consulting for them or whatever it is, and you wanna save money by reducing the fuel consumption. So on flat highways, things are pretty simple. You gradually accelerate to a reasonable speed, let's say 70 miles an hour or 60 or whatever it is, and you maintain that speed as, as, as best as you can. And as long as that's a reasonable speed, the fuel economy at that speed is probably, probably fine. But the challenges can be as follows. One scenario would be you see a hill. You could push the engine up the hill and maintain your speed of let's say 70 miles an hour, uh, and then you coast down the hill. Or what about if you accelerate before the hill, you reach let's say 73 miles an hour, and you accelerate mildly, you're not pushing the engine, you're just giving a bit more gas. And then when you're moving up the hill, you start the hill at 73, and then you reduce to 71, 69, 67. And at the top of the hill, you're somewhat less than 70, but you maintained your 70. And on the top of the hill, you're again, mid to upper 60s, and you're coasting down. And now it's possible that the hill is steep enough that it'll take you to a faster speed, where it's possible that without any gas, you can maintain that mid to upper 60s, and with just a minimal amount of gas, you can return to 70 miles an hour. So what's more efficient? Pushing the engine up the hill, maintaining the 70, and when you're going down the hill, maybe you're even braking. Well, braking is a waste of energy, right? Um, or, or maybe anticipating the hill, especially if you have a GPS, and the GPS gives you elevation information, you can, anticipate that first you'll be going uphill and then you'll going to be down, downhill and maybe that's better. And uh, putting aside gas consumption, I, I assure you that if you're really pushing your engine, like really pushing it, uh, yeah, that's, that's not good for the engine. So wear and tear is also a consideration. Another challenge would be you see a red light. One possibility is that you coast toward the light and you gradually reduce the speed by coasting. And as you approach the light, you either tap the brakes toward the end, or if suddenly the red light becomes green, you increase speed. Another possibility is that you see the red light and you accelerate, you, you don't care. You're, you're going the speed limit, or maybe even a bit above the speed limit. You're, you're going, let's say 35 mile per hour zone in town, and you're accelerating to 40, you don't care if there's a light in 200 yards, and 50 yards before the light, you're gonna slam your brakes. So again, slamming brakes is not efficient. So the main point here is that there's a dynamic behavior between the past, the present, and the future. And the past per, uh, creates a state that we're currently in. That state is the current speed and also the upcoming uh, topography uphill, downhill, flat, etc. And our actions that we perform right now in the present will modify the state such that in the future, we might be, if we see a hill and we accelerate it a bit, we might be at the bottom of the hill a bit over 70 miles an hour. Or maybe in a greedy way, we just maintain 70 and we don't care. So there's a dynamic behavior that based on the action at present, it's linking the past to the present. Finally, a fourth application, process design in factories. Consider a factory with a complicated process. We wanna buy less chemicals, less inputs. We wanna use less energy. We want our product to be produced quickly. We'd like to be robust to surprises such as power shortages. So there are a lot of things that ideally we'd like to do. And our goal is to tune the production process to minimize the costs. What are the costs? They could involve inputs, chemicals, energy, time, robustness, you name it. And this is known as a multi-objective optimization. We wanna, 
we can't we can't do perfect on all the objectives or well maybe we can but that would be a rare situation we probably can't we want to do pretty well on a bunch of uh, a bunch of objectives so that'll be some motivation material for optimization and we'll continue with dynamic programming next time in module number 21.